So, hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I always have like the setup time. So I try to get to get started. So I am really late. <laughs> Are you about um so what do we do? What do we have today? Anyone? I came with no specific questions. No specific questions. Okay. That's all on you, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was this isn't just what it was today, but it was like seven to one. Can you tell me the problems? Uh, which problems we had? Oh, um, five, three, five, five, six, three, seven, one. So fun. So excited for you guys. Have a great weekend. All right. Uh, so, when you said, you were going to say, I said eight, three, and seven, one. Does that help you? Is, is there a new? Oh, we did this today. Yeah. Proof that a domain of finite order is a field. So, that's not true, actually. Is it true? I think it actually is. I was going to say a division algorithm. I think it has to be. I want to say it. it's also true that it's not just a division. But I don't remember if he defines domain as. I think he defines domains as any order. I don't. I believe there's no finite division ring. Though. Division rings are like non-commutative fields. Like the quaternions actually form a division. Everything's invertible. They are a ring, but they don't commute. So that that makes it a sort of special ring. I think finite, there are no finite divisions, if I remember correctly. Like finiteness and sure some I think he, but I think his domains are all you know, so you don't have to worry about it. We did that in class. Yeah. Let's do a refresher. <laughs> Since I did it in class, I don't feel at all bad. Not really. So you don't remember? Very familiar. I thought what we did in class was quite different. So he yeah. calls domain integral domain. I'm fine with you. Just um, integral domain is domain. Oh, we did do that. Okay. Which is not to be confused with like a domain of a function in a three dimensional space or something like that. It's an algebraic notion. Um, let's check the. I, I want to see. Did he? I think he does. Oh, yeah, there's like these field fractions. Let's see. I saw me for the first time all the way back in section like, chapter 11. Well, he does have this. I don't mean But this all is in the context of a commutative. This, this is just not, none of this shit works if it's not commutative. Like, it does not work. So, I don't know where he says that he's only considering commutative rings, but he's got to say that somewhere. So, I think, I think you can, I think you're pretty safe assuming commutative. Let's assume. Let's see where he writes this. Maybe he just says at the beginning of the chapter. 
I mean, I always feel like you're not talking about much. I don't, I don't know if that's, it's, I don't remember reading. Ah, his rings are commutative. There's a related concept, a non-commutative ring. This is also called a ring. <laughs> like, you don't generally, this is a very anomalous thing. Like, I don't think any of, I didn't realize that you're that. That's not what you're going to find in any book ever. This is like totally so. Everyone at home, don't ever tell anybody that you saw that. <laughs> like to do that. Rings are not necessarily commutative, period. Like there's no way. If you had to say commutative, if you had to say non-commutative ring every time you talk about rings, he's saying it. Well, you guys are not saying it, but I'd be saying it all the time. Everybody be saying it. rings are rings. Commutative rings are commutative rings. Non-commutative, I mean, you don't assume that. That's crazy talk. Crazy art. Sorry. About that, so use my definition. That a set of yeah. Since we won't be studying non commutative rings, we use the word ring to mean commutative ring. Well, it's fine to say that. It's fine to say from here on out, all rings we'll consider are commutative. But you should define it as. Anyway, so yeah, so you got it easy. I did that one in class. What was the other one? Seven one? Or eight three. Or not seven one. Eight three. Yeah. Not what I meant. But I feel like three minus on that class, I'm not just that. But we did say we did kind of give the key. We gave the key uh, result. So that we ended class last time today with a theorem, proposition, or whatever, which is in our it says that if. Uh, well, the, the maximal ideals of polynomial ring fx um, are well. You take a they're all principal because it's a principal ideal domain. Uh, but now you can assume assume what the theorem says. This is irreducible. Well, to be a maximal ideal, it's the same thing as so maximal ideal. So here we have three different things. If F irreducible, if and only if Fx maximal ideal, if and only if. Uh, F of X mod F X. These are all equivalent. So you can, with that in mind, you can look at this question and say, okay, these, this being a field or this one being a field is equivalent to the underlying polynomial being irreducible. So we want to check f x. The problem is saying show that this is irreducible. And f 
two. And, but, thanks. You notice that it's the same polynomial, right? Reducible, which means not irreducible. How would you do that? You know, I, I beg of you. Well, I don't beg. You know, but I beg of you to consider being the calculus. When you look at that polynomial, what do you think? You're not supposed to recognize it. That's what you're doing. You're not supposed to. <laughs> I think they do as well. They do this in some kind of course. Calculus or calendar or calculus or they have like these courses. They take a polynomial, have a bigger app. They don't have calculus in so much, but they draw graphs. So if you have a polynomial, if it's a linear polynomial, you get a line. If it's quadratic, you get a parabola, cubic. So what do you get? You get some, you guys know what you get. Qualitative. I mean, like, are you just like asking what the graph looks like? Sure, tell me. I mean, it's like, I don't know how to describe it. This one would like, have to just go like this. Like, like, I don't know. Like, like that. that. <laughs> ah, that's kind of, well, there you go. That's actually what I was looking for. Tell me about it. Tell me about this guy. You can tell me. You were telling, you were going like this. That's right. I mean, we're doing it backwards because you're sitting at it backwards. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so this looks like that, something like that, right? Or it could look like that. It looks something like that. But one thing you know from calculus is that it, like, it goes through the x-axis. It has a root. Okay. Uh, polynomials, they have odd degree polynomials. Right? So with that as our inspiration, of course, we're at now of our finite field, but with that as our inspiration, we can ask about the irreducibility of these things. And you can just for a minute forget about this polynomial and forget about the fields. Ask about it for any cubic polynomial with regards to any field. If the, if the polynomial is, irre, is, is reducible, if I can write it as a product of two non trivial polynomials, non constant polynomials, what are the degrees of those two? Let's say f of x is cubic, and we have some factorization over here, like this, where these are not constant. That means that this is reducible. This holds if and only if. What are the degrees of g and h up to switching g? Which means that one of these is linear, which means you have a root. And that's only for only cubics, only the cubics. Well, okay, I'm glad you're out of <laughs> but you know, once you get to once you get to cortex, know that that's not true anymore, and then life becomes a lot harder, <laughs> like a lot harder, not a little harder. <laughs> So really a lot harder. We're trying to solve these things. This is a good place to be, cubics. Not so bad. Um, so yeah. So we know that the answer to this question 
will be whether or not there is a linear factor, which means there is a root. Like we saw, we've seen that all right. We've already seen, we've seen f of x is divisible by x minus alpha. Of course, if you have a linear factor, you can make it monic. If and only if f of alpha is zero. The root. This is the f of alpha being zero, that means the root. This means that it's reducible from a cubic. So now life is easy, right? I'm supposed to say, oh god, it's too easy for me. How do we do the f2 f? Whoa, well, well, that's the why it's so easy. What is a root? Zero. Well, what is a root though? What is it? What is its essence? What is it? If, I, if you find a root to a polynomial, if you go to talk to a pre-calc student or whatever they call them, uh, and you say that polynomial has a root, and they say, well, what's the root? You say, what or do you say? What is what is it that you're telling them it has? What is the root? <laughs> that could be way too philosophical here. What is the root? What is it, what does it mean to say I've got a root? Not what does it mean to say I've got a root? Let's say I have a root. Do I give you like you know a vegetable or something? Or what do I what am I giving you when I tell you the root what the root of this is what? What is that? What's alpha? No, no, not where, not qualitatively. What is it? Period. What is it? It's a number. It's a number. But what okay, is what kind of number? Is it a quaternion? No. For a calculus student, what number is it? It's a real number. And what kind of thing is the polynomial? It's a real polynomial. You don't do complex polynomials. Students, that'd be crazy. Right? Your root is in the field of coefficients. The root is an element of that field of coefficients. I need this to be in the polynomial, which means alpha needs to be an F. How many alphas are in F? In F2. Okay, check. Zero cube plus zero plus one, one. One cube plus one plus one, one. F of zero equals one equals F of one. No roots, irreducible. Okay, how many possibilities do we have here? Three. Start with f of zero. f of zero equals zero cubed with zero plus one. That's one. f of one. We found a root. x minus one divides x cubed. x cubed plus x cubed. X. Let's see if we can, let's just make sure x cubed plus x plus one is the five. We'll do it like we always do. We'll be choose to. x squared here, and x cubed minus. I need to subtract, right? So it's something minus negative x positive. x squared plus x plus one. I plus x x squared minus x, I subtract, zero, x minus negative x is two x. Uh, oh, you know that two is also negative one, not three.
or skin. Means that the quotient is actually not a field. The quotient will actually split into a product of many. One will be a field F3, and the other, no. What is the 70 roots? Zero is not. One is not. Oh, wait, one, yeah, one is not. Two. Oh, I can't read. One plus two. So no roots. This is a field though. So this is actually a sum of, this is a product of two fields. Just to further the problem, because you know, I know you guys know. If I quotient this, this is actually isomorphic of F3 cross something you've never seen before, F9. Field of nine elements. It's not Z mod nine. Moving on. What do you think? Questions? Why did you get F3 cross F9? Did you just that? No, it's based on what we did today. What we did today, we did for integers, but we can do it for anything. Any, well, not anything. For any um, PID, for ideal domain. X minus one is irreducible. And so is x squared plus x plus one. We check our minus one. We just check this when we put in values to see if we have roots, which again, you cannot do if you have a quarter. That won't work. Come down on that so that you don't make that mistake. But since they're both irreducible, it's not hard to show, well, that the greatest common divisor is one. It means just like we did with integers that so we get these two item codes. So then when we quotient by this thing, just like we did with Z mod N or Z mod NM, we get a product of two rings. In this case, we'll get the product of quotienting by each one of them. So that says that this guy, is going to be isomorphic Is isomorphic the following two quotients for the same exact reasoning that we had in class today, with where we replace this polynomial ring with integers and these two factors with n and m. This cross with x mod x squared plus x minus one. Now, this first guy. It's just essentially evaluate at one, x at one, and you'll just pick up F3. This quotient is just isomorphic to F3. This guy, we're quotienting by an irreducible polynomial, principal ideal generated by it, but a, which is a maximal ideal. And so you're quoting, so you get a field here. And the question is how many elements does that field have? Early on in rings, we saw that if we divided by this, what we had left over was going to be two dimensional because this is a order two polynomial. Namely the remainder, we, we can classify these in terms of the remainder and every, all the remainders look like this. For A and B are in F3. This is, this is gonna be, you get representatives that look like this for all of the different elements. But how many possibilities are there? Well, you have three possibilities for A, three for, for B, and three times three is nine. So in fact, this is a field with nine elements. And it turns out that there is up to isomorphism only one field with any given number of elements, prime power. So if you're, by the way, any, sorry, let me rephrase that. Given a prime power order, so like three squared or three cubed or five out of 100, 
there is exactly one field of the isomorphism. We can have different representations of this. There are a lot of different ways. That's all I got. So you're right for asking. <laughs> but hopefully it was clear. That made sense. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that it made sense. I'm glad that it made sense. Yeah, I rarely make sense. So if I get an opportunity to make sense. Most of the time. <laughs> the first step of okay. <laughs> what I'm looking at seven three. It feels like it's too easy. It feels like you can just use the fact that seven one that any domain of finite order is a field to say that like f mod fifteen or f fifteen is a field. Therefore, it's also a domain. That work? Or well, that okay. Well, what is f fifteen? Not, not a plane. Is there other planes? That sounds like a plane. Yeah, 15. Like a gun or something like that. It's like a Ford truck or something. F-150. <laughs> yeah. F-150, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Something. That sounded like something very, you know, like masculine. <laughs> Destructive. Is there, is there an F-15? That's my first thought when I saw it, but I think so. Is it? Is not yeah. Perfect. So, so f. So you're right. If there, if there is a finite domain, you've already shown in seven one that has to be a field. So you're asking, is this does this exist? In other words, is there a field of fifteen elements? Why wouldn't there be, right? I remember once, I tell you guys the story, I remember once when I was in Louisville, Kentucky, right after I finished high school, I finished early, I went to stay with my grandma, I worked at a library. And the evenings I would go to this local Denny's and I would read this book on college. But that's how I roll. Because <laughs> that's what you were doing when you graduated high school. Yeah, I was interested in college. I was in college. I fell in love with it right there and then at Denny's. And I was telling this woman who worked there in the night shift about Godel's incompleteness theorem, which I thought was really amazing and interesting. It has nothing to do with college. And that some theorems that you can state have no proof or disprove. It's impossible to prove them. You can prove that you can't prove them. I remember her saying, well, if you put your mind to it, I'll bet you can do it. But no. Actually, just that's the whole point is that you can't prove that you can't do it. <laughs> so, but we went back and forth several times and I just gave up. Why wouldn't it exist? Why wouldn't it exist? Some things don't exist as much as we want them to. Some techniques cannot be proved, you know, some statements can't be proved. Z mod 15, good question. Hey, there's a finite ring, 15 elements. Three times five equals zero there. So if I had an inverse, three, I would get five, let's say five equals zero. Five's not zero. You can have zero divisors. But we, I just told you there's a field with nine elements. You, so there are fields with the el, number of elements that are not five. So does it, what do you think? I thought it was because it was trying to be five. Okay, I, that's, you're right, I did say that. I did say that, but what, why? Who cares? Who cares? Cares about fields with 15 elements. That's good because they don't. Don't waste your caring. I love advice for you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, why? I'll tell you it doesn't exist. And in fact, you're right. The only, only numbers that have, uh, only finite fields that exist have uh, prime power. So 15 is not a prime power. There's no field with 15. The reason is, is that if you have a field, finite field or field otherwise, you can talk about its characteristics. So what I can do, let's say I have a finite field F, I can take one, one is an element of F, and I can look at all of the sub, all, all of the multiples of one. In other words, I can add one to itself as many times as I want. Add one. I can end. Now, if I do that, I'm gonna get some sub ring. This is, right, so N times one, it's called Z times one. This will map into my field F. I'll get some sub ring of F. I can just add one, multiply one, and so on. If F is finite, I get a finite sub ring. So this will actually kernel because it's finite. So it's going to be some finite thing. I'm not sure what to call it. I'll call it K. That includes. But F is a field, which means K is a field, right? Because all the elements have inverse. So what are the, but K is isomorphic to Z mod something. Mod N. And one thing you can check, like we did here, is that if we have a field that's Z mod N, N must be prime. Right? Otherwise, if N is a composite, like we did this in class today, if N is a composite, you have zero. Is take those two factors. They are zero factors. So that means that n is prime. Okay, so I've got a prime and I've got a field FP. So that says that if F is a field, then there is some finite field, then there's some prime P. So that I'll get a subfield of P inside of that. P is called the character of the That means that, but now think about F and forget about multiplication. It's an abelian group under addition. I've got this subfield of P in it. I can multiply, you know, I think of these things as separate and multiply elements in here by elements in here. If I got an addition and I can multiply by things in here, I call F of vector space. Talk about vector spaces right over fields. F of vector space over F. It's finite, not just finite dimensional, it is finite, and therefore it is definitely finite dimensional. So let's say its dimension is n. Okay, we prove that all finite dimensional vector spaces are isomorphic as vector spaces. Vector space. What? F is an n dimensional vector space over a field. Okay, what is F isomorphic? As more to the pro product, Cartesian product. I mean, the thing is a column matrices, like row matrices or whatever. How many elements are in there? Which one of these says P? I have a set with R elements, and I take the Cartesian product instead of S elements. Well, mathematicians devise these notations to be very nice. So, 
how many elements in here? Fifteen is not the fifth one. Except fifteen. <laughs> or two hundred and what matter? What's the uh, square? Two twenty five. Yeah, two twenty five. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> We're learning things. We didn't come here to learn things, but we're learning many things. That's why I love problem sessions. It's a spiral. First one you ended up talking about dense spheres. Yeah. I don't. I don't feel. I feel like because I'm volunteering my time, I can kind of do what I want. As long as I'm slightly helpful to you guys, I feel like. The rest of the time, I can be totally unhelpful. I don't feel bad about that. I would feel bad about that for a lecture. This is enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, is that it? I'm looking at another one. Uh, it didn't seem too bad. Everyone's going to get these right. So I would suggest, I won't say much more about it, but I would suggest you, you take what I just said when you're looking at this problem, take what I just said to heart. You know, one thing you can start to do when you are interested in classifying those rings, you can start with one and just look at that sub ring that's generated by. Another thing you can do is you can ask about what the abelian groups are. That would be the additive groups. There aren't that many, by which I mean it's isomorphism. Well, it's Um, I like that. So, Yeah, these look like good, these look like fun. So maybe I'll leave you guys with, I think I've given hints with all but one, one or two. I've got a grade one or two of these. <laughs> so, I mean, hey, the last time I graded almost everybody got 100% of the base. It was two months set in the Bristol College. You guys did great. These two, I think you guys. Yeah. Yeah. The other one is six, three, kind of. No, no, a six three will be very possible. Okay, thanks for coming. Yes, it's fun.